Hi, I'm Jake Hankus. I um, work now at the University of Leiden, but until not so long ago at the University of Bristol. And I show you stuff from both of these today, and I work on the active matter tissue models and everything in between. Hi, I'm Robin Sellinger from the Advanced Materials and Liquid Crystal Institute and the Physics Department at Penn State. And I work on liquid crystals, after liquid crystals, liquid crystal adopters. Um, I am Rita de Almeida. I work in South of Brazil for collecting, and I'm interested in uh, cell migration and model, computational model for larger cells than the general. And that's uh, how uh, my name is Miguel from the University of Washington. I'm in the math department, and I'm interested in uh, collecting and information, uh, and you're going to start with that. Yeah, I'm going to go to the University of Washington. Oh, sure. Hi, I'm Clara Chapman, University of Amsterdam, Department of Physics, and I'm generally for an active matter, specifically active polymer, which is generally I want to have a shape and reflection. I'm Liverpool, one of the programs as well. I'm interested in. I guess in soft matter generally, in active matter in particular, and I guess in active matter, I guess I work on one level models for fit biopsies into like tissue, and another level I'm interested in molecules steady states in active matter. Thank you. I am uh, Anton Susla. I'm currently studying this path that I'm interested in active solids, active metamaterial. I'm in Bristol, and I'm working on crystals and their crystals. Still, it's a very important time sharing. Still, it's a very important time sharing. Both of you, yeah, couple of weeks, right? From the University of Korea, and uh, I'm interested in mathematical models for uh, pneumatic physics crystals, and I'm also interested in active pneumatic cells. Yeah, the reason why I'm here from another program. <laughs> yeah. uh, hi, uh, my name is Tomohiro Sakamoto from Tokyo Institute of Technology. I'm mainly working on no equivalent technique, and uh, in particular, I have been working on math mathematical. Aspect like the exact solutions of cases and KTV. Uh, but uh, I'm also one of the organizers, but uh, my part is kind of almost finished, I think. But I'd be happy to learn more and uh, try to exchange more ideas and things like that. I'll give you. Thank you. There's a very good moment to do this. There we go. And finally, I'm Arthur Snapback. I am uh, a physics system embedded in a uh, life science department here at the in Scotland, and uh, I'm interested in applying active methods to understanding the APR in the sciences, particularly. And uh, off we go with self stuff, which is sort of continuation of what I was about to start with on last Thursday. Yeah, so it's a slightly different perspective on, I mean, not going to talk about exactly the same thing. So uh, you will not have waste in a second attendance, but you'll see, you'll see how it fits together. So 
let me get started. Um, so uh, you've seen some of these movies before, so we show them. So if you look at uh, collective cell mechanics and dynamics in epithelial cell sheets, and I'm going to use the word cell sheet here, not the word or tissue yet, because this is very much in vitro, usually on the substrate in the lab, uh, especially things like NBCK cells or in the case of often we have a point on this country, yeah. Uh, uh, you did a call yourself, but what they do is something looks generically the same. You get some sort of bizarre that swirly kind of crawling motion, which has seems to have fascinated all the physicists. So there has in the last 10 years been run a lot of theoretical approaches to this, including uh, the active pneumatics we have talked talk here about as much of the time. So I will show you what it's, if you want a uh, complementary approach to this, in the first part of this talk, based purely on uncorrelated active driving, so no active pneumatics. At the same time, as actually Rasko already pointed out uh, last week, tissues are not cell sheets on the substrate, and especially they are not cell sheets on the substrate if you look at actual development in embryogenesis. So this is two examples. The first one here, that's gastrulation in Drosophila, when the fruit fly, every dot here is a cell. And this thing for, for the spontaneous it folds inside out in the first step of making the organism. So topologically, we go from a sphere to a tube at this point, and it's evolutionary conserved, 700 million years old or similar. So this is important. And it's the same process here in the chicken embryo, which I'll get back to in the latter part of this talk. So we'd like to understand this kind of system. And oh yeah, this isn't working. So so if uh, so let me get the straight to an outline. So if I jump down to this ultimately, the important bit I would like to talk about is how do we bring activity correctly into these models and what are the resulting emerging mechanics that it's all going to be happening at the microscopic level, so not at the continuous scale level. So if I take a second picture of my epithelium or cell sheet, we will get soft, squishy cells looking so much like this. And they're either interacting with the substrate or they're not, but mainly we have get a certain skeleton being here uh, around the cell, and it either can pull on any substrate using popular vegan, or it can equally importantly, they can pull on each other and have a contractile article surface like that uh, like here. So, but what it falls down to all of these different com complex mechanical pieces in the cell sheets, we need to take into account, we need to into account if we want to build realistic models of activity. And there's a lot to be said, and I'm not going to cover what said what models they will include, include a lot more detail than I'm going to do. I will focus on two different aspects of adding activity. One of them is activity, which is crawling, so activity crawling over substrate, the crawling cell. The other one is activity, which is a long cell cell junction. So, which by definition is, if I'm going to symmetry, one of these is cycles, the other one of these is vector. So, two different classes of activity, and they're not the same thing, even though people often call strain and the same sort of thing. And so, I'll talk about two pieces of this one with feedback, the one without feedback, and I will start without feedback. Talking about you see it actually going in part of the SPD vertex model, we find that we match these experimental cell sheets. Then I go into the issue of feedback first on the crawling side, gradually to example, including one on the crawling of the mouse. And then finally, I spent the last piece on this, which is the most biological and most um, complicated, if you want, on junction junction by the activity. Okay, so let's start at the beginning with this here. So I should say this first part is in collaboration with all of these people here, one of whom is in the audience, obviously Rasko here. So this this is we have worked together for um it's going to be almost 10 years now, right? So a lot of this is is coming out of these years. Okay, so let me start at something which I'm sure you've all seen, which is Arctic particles. So the idea with ADP is almost if you want an Ising model of the simplest thing you could possibly do, which could work for itself. And it would be such that, okay, I have something folded in the substrate, so my activity should be vectored, it will become then V0N. Yeah. 
magnitudes, unit vectors, and connect all them using fully over the modular dynamic and they interact with everybody else to some not further specified uh, attractive or repulsive uh, pair interactions or cross rate interactions at the very least. Now, if you write that down generically, then you get this equation. So that's the fully over the modular dynamic. And then the simplest thing you could possibly do to close this that is close this dynamics is to have that like, direction of activity not coupled to any anywhere else in the system, but just the use of the time. So this is active from the dynamic to the to the side the angle of the activity direction. It's the it diffuses within an orientation of the system trying to inverse the tension between the constant. So you see this all over the highlight this as this is a big model. So everything else starts building on top of this. And you say, okay, see this all around, but it's actually useful. And I'll try to convince you that we can get something quantitative out of this for cell sheets. I wanted to highlight already, and I, if you see this movie, this is, incidentally, this is a reverse MIPS region of phase space with most of the paper. The red arrows here is the velocity. You can already see the effect is kind of swirly. A spatial temporally correlated velocity fields in the same. It looks qualitatively a lot like the ones you see in the cell fields. And I want, to I want to convince you that this is actually a quantitative explanation. So, in fact, what you can do is, and you can do a bit of theory, and it's in fact uh, extremely simple. So, you can say, well, I'm very nearly in an active solid phase, and more specifically, an active glass phase in a lot of these systems. So, what I'm going to say is that I'm, I have a solid and I have active driving, which is uncorrelated in space and correlated in time at places in this. And so I'm going to distort an elastic sheet, essentially. And if I, if, if I do this, then write my dynamic linear response. You can see it here, you have a dynamic matrix in here. You can use all the mode formalism in all of this. And this is not unlike the sort of calculation you might do in, in math biology or something like that. You, you, it's classic. Uh, as a, a, a classic style of calculation, you can end up causing this thing linear response because it's spatially uncorrelated. With, uh, and you get a spectrum per mode, the energy per mode of the system, which is very far from the partition systematically. And uh, if you remember your uh, fluctuation dissipation and all of this, you get a peak in front of here, which would be the partition with this linear effective temperature on how beta is being spread out. Then you the same, you would get a synaptic on and part of the solution coefficient, but you get a correction here, which depends on the mode and the persistent time. You systematically go away where, in fact, you dampen the energy in modes with large eigenvalues. Now, this looks really abstract right now, but what you can do uh, is that if you actually Use this in continuum and couple it to use linear elasticity for my sheet instead of for normal modes. You can recast it as follows. You can say, I have a colored active noise with a great magnification, so it's different to the Lorentzian here, one such so on the square instead of the flat. And this is the programmer noise. You squeeze this back into your overgram dynamics. You do a nice calculation and contour integral that comes out with it. And you end up with a velocity correlation, something like this. And then confusing velocity correlations, because this is what you can measure the PID in the cell sheet rather easily. And the other, what you get is a correlation length in there. And we get a correlation length which comes from the interaction of the persistent time of the active driving with the bulk and shear moduli of the elastic solid. And it's a very simple prediction. If you set an along the two loops, the transverse contribution logically in the bulk modulus, transverse to shear modulus, which goes like tau times b dot mu here over friction coefficients, and only to that method, the system time get up in modular and friction. So this is something you can, in fact, potentially measure in your sheets. So it's a very simple type of prediction. It also shows the square scaling to the system time. So I should say several people came up with this since. It's a relatively old kind of uh, kind of idea. So this is relatively also further explored of improper legal systems, but this is the basic idea. Now, this is neat. And what's interesting is that it actually works very really well. So this isn't currently a cell sheet yet. This is just an active prominent simulation. And what we see here on the on the left is that the velocity correlation comes to the Fourier space. 
Feld as a function of persistence size, we have to say this is the graph of frames that is the actual axis solid. And the dots are simulations with continuous lines on normal modes in the depth line. It's a continuum prediction. So as you can see, the normal modes in the simulation are span on top of each other. So it works extremely well. And the continuum works very well, where it's supposed to work, which is at low two. And now we took it from the for a one out three. This is from the static structure fact and was tells in my system has first neighbor, which is not in the continuum description. More interestingly, and that's why there's no fit in the by the way, this is just straight calculation. Uh, it, once you go into the liquid phase, it still works. It, it, it works as long and it is more as empirical. My persistence time of active driving is small compared to the alpha relaxation time of, 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 of my superfluid liquid. So as long as essentially the basic picture is I'm traveling with the heavy minimum of my classic system, so as long as I sit there happily and explore this on the time scale to be shorter and the time can anyway, we think it'll work. The links are so because you don't have to be strictly a solid, not try to think. I should say, by the way, to empirically, here we just got simulation picture solid and one and liquid one. And as you can see, they are indistinguishable. So, what we get here is solid, but we get correlation and it's still uh, survived. Yeah. Okay, the ball with the error direction. Like, uh, I should have said, okay, this is just completely stupid, but it's just harmonic repulsion, nothing else. Okay, so when you say you have a thing and you move, so you will, this you have to relate somehow to the this okay, so I use actually normal mode to compute them so that we will try on the player technique. So you can you can use uh, not the normal modes to compute the actual DNA for different parking, that's where they come from. So then numerically computed on the parking in the near spot as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean just the general yeah. thing you said that there is no spatial correlations. In the active driving in, active the, in this model, in this model yeah, yeah, but but, but 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 in some sense, it fits, fits quite well the simulations. Yeah. So do you have an argument? Do you have some simple argument why there there is there, there is no. But the simulations also have no special correlation. So this is why it's only consistent. So I haven't said anything else yet. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but okay, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so even if I started with with Let's see, I'm, I'm just thinking if I had started with a bunch of particles yeah. which were active and then I made them very dense, I could imagine that there would be, there could be some spatial points yeah. that might emerge. Yeah, but that's the point, right? So there is spatial knowledge which emerges in the actual velocity field, yeah. but not in the active driving I'm putting in, because at least by definition, in the heavy field, there isn't, and that's what all there is so far. Okay, so basically, you're saying that essentially speaking, the, the the, the active driving term gives you your, if you want, your, your noise term, yeah, and then exactly. your elastic term comes purely from the. Yeah, everything else is emergent. Yeah. yeah. It's so, not but they come from mm -hmm. the interaction. Yeah. Okay. So, I, so I guess my, my so my main question is that is this then, um, the effective elasticity yeah. doesn't depend at all. Right. Yes, yeah, so there is no coupling, hence why I also the no feedback part of the talk. I will come back to this question, but I think the start of it, it gets much more interesting. But here you can calculate stuff. That's the only point I was trying to make. Or oh, actually, this was one of two points I was trying to make. The second one is that thank you for asking the question of the potential. In fact, it, that, that was just purely harmonic repulsion. We should do something better. And in fact, one of the better things we can use is using a vertex model. So Rusk introduced it already uh, last week, but just uh, to remind you. So the idea is that these exterior cell sheets or cells or sheets are looked vaguely like a cobblestone pavement of a confluent layer of tissue, which you can roughly approximate at polygons. Yeah, not a perfect approximation, but a really sensible one in a dense tissue. And then if you say everything is polygons, I can associate energy to this. Now, should I associate energy to this as a conservative process? Probably not, but that's a separate question I'll come back to. But you can do this. And there have been a series of these, and I'm now this, this is a version of the vertex model, which has become the most common use in the physics community. We said, I have an area change penalties and the compressibility, the thickness suffer, and the target area A0. 
and the target is the same activity, so it's contactivity is done with the of video player. Okay. So originally people looked only at tissue shapes using energy minimization. So what I would like to do is if you follow on uh, from where Max B led and use what's called a hypothermal and a self-effect model, which is the first is essentially the first marriage of Africon and Rising and vertex models, and it says the following. So let me just pretend a vertex model is a really complicated multi-particle potential, essentially, and continue driving myself at the center, uh, at its geometric center. I then have equations which are actually identical with ABC equations, and then I have to apply the rule. With only the difference, I need to take a gradient of the vertex model potential here instead of straight there and darkness. Now, this sounds easy, but it's hard because vertex models are defined by the vertex positions, not the center positions. So what you need to do is you need to map between vertices and center and the only continuous differentiable like well being if not, so we have anyone has found so far, if then only volatile, you can self propel volatile model because all of the cell shapes then are volatile tiles. And then if you do this as implemented here, this is of Last of last, the students, and we did this one here together. You can, you can get something like this. So it's a very nice tool. Have a look. You can install this one and use it. And I should say, and I don't want to emphasize it, but people that look at the mechanics of this, or hidden transitions, I won't go into this again, but there is one of the function of PVO, the square root of the PVO, the uh, so PVO divided by square root of PVO, parameters of the vertex models in that. Elongated and two cells here, and more or less hexagonal solid cells here. And you can learn this by the ending, but we did it somewhere here in the fluid region. In any case, since this thing is a solid region, and even though it's a nasty potential, one can in fact compute an estimate of this thing. Everything I said before about the elastic sheets is in fact, in fact carries over, and we do this exact same. Calculation as, as, as I did for the ABCs, so for SPV vertex model. You see the velocity correlation function. So we didn't do the hazard for this one because it's painful, but we can do the continuous fit and do modularize the uh, calculated for other people. You can fit this, and you can see we have the exact same consistent uh, time dependent, and we have less expensive of time on this. So you can see when you put this in time is low, you have almost flat velocity correlation. Then this drops and the persistent time is high. That means a lot more at low Q and a lot less at high Q. That means there's a spatial correlation emerging in the system. So you get spatially correlation with the vertex model, same as in the ABPs. And I should say you can scale all of these on top of each other in some universal scaling, which we all essentially. Transfer correlation length and mean square velocity in the system. And so this is the thermal limit here. And this is to complete the infinitely active persistent driving limit. And everything goes onto one single equilibrium to non equilibrium curve from here. So now that we have this established as sort of a thing, let's see the simple models. But so, it, um, yeah. Just, yeah. Um, we... The fit yeah. seems not as good for this as for the ABP model. Is that uh, right? The continuum is about equally good. All of this stuff here is again, this is the this is this is the, this is the structure factor emerging, which is more complicated for the next model than for simple particles and do this and then all it really don't really understand this one much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, even at even at uh, low Q seems to be good. Really example, I'd say it's it's about equal. The body equally good or bad. I should say, I mean, we did not internally quite get off this module. I mean, it was slightly stuffy compared to the other one when being being like this. And at the time, I oh, well, we had very limited manpower, so okay, it was satisfactory okay. to me at the time. Okay, so what you said is that the yeah. methods for extracting the, your moduli is easier for the much for the yeah. particle than the things. Yes, and I guess that. I mean, because at least for me, for the for your two thousand tau two thousand one looks to be not so good. But yeah, just... I should say two thousand has other issues which I can look. I'd like to tell you about things which are more interesting than that, and okay, so I can tell you about the the other issues we also have to do with 
unique, minimal, and complicated energy landscapes and things. Yes. Yeah. Can you just say about the condition persistent time? Yeah, okay. So if you want to think of it like where does it come from? Yeah. So think of yourself in a dense crowd of people or anything, and you try to persist with it. But you importantly, when you overdance, because you overdance, you're acting, you, you're pushing people that is spread diffusively around. So this elastic information is spread with like a diffuse, a bit, a bit, a bit diffuse it. And so the idea is how far do I push people out of the way until a chain is somewhere around them becomes there. That length scale, with, with a, 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 that length scale at the time scale, when I start rearranging, because that's what it's always going to be, essentially. That's where that number comes from. So it's how far do I get in the time I'm pointing in the same direction? And the longer I start I'm pointing in the same direction, the further I get. That's ultimately where it comes from, but it's also fairly because of the diffuse uh, spreading. That's ultimately what it is. I just feel when I yeah. put much longer in the same direction, I call it more. Yeah, and that's but exactly what the prediction is saying. Yeah, it's good that the diffuse cube is still too straight, other way around. It's already yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's exactly what it's saying. Yeah. It's a very generic thing that actually we find in the that you can apply it to the string of what you found with the two with quite a generic type of mechanism. So, what did I say? Okay, so hence, here are some cell sheets. So, these are human formula, the bacterial cells, and some in the moment why we use these keys, except for that nothing called in that we did a lot in Aberdeen. And so, this is not the prettiest type of experiment since it's not nicely highlighted with 15,000 cell blocks or so. However, the one thing you can do with this is you can do PIV. So you can get your spatial temporal correlation function out of these out of, out of these cell sheets, which you can see here. And as you can see, these look indeed spatial temporally correlated in ways. If you're familiar now or now, I should say by the way, these are actually spread out. I share that this. I don't think we have actually marked anything going on here. As far as I can tell, so we fitted it to uh, the type of simulation which I showed you. And so, the first thing we did is um, we fitted this the best acceleration function to the continuum model, which you see here. And so, with a bit of planar scaling, we end up with a single parameter fit. We get both in the second correlation range, and it's if we fit the one parameter fit you see here. And to get a single length scale, which turns out to be something like in this case, it's, uh, it's roughly 100 microns, so it's five or six cell diameter. In this model, this is quantitatively consistent. That's what people see in MDCK or generic in all of the systems, including the ones where people identify the effect. So, always the same sort of length scale of this of correlation in here. Uh, we have the scale velocity. Mean velocity which puts us in this weird scale of things somewhere here, which means it's highly isotonic. So, this in our framework at least is very much not thermal system, it's very far, it's very active, very driven, very str strongly correlated. So, we can do more though. So, what we can do is we can create a content that model. Yeah. So, I'm going to the model next to which single cell is doing can take one hour. Well, that would be lovely, but that's the that, that methodology. I take out a single cell on the sheet. As also, wait, I'm going to tell you that they stop behaving the same way. They're going to look like if you say like a medium camera transition, they're going to look like a project and take off. So, very qualitatively, it will speed up with this consistent with the potential for taking one hour to pop out. I should say single particle that's active from the motion, so it's reasonably consistent with the sort of models we showed them last week. Yeah, but I would not try this quantitatively as they they change type when you try it. That's that's part of the problem of biology, yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, it's all a bit indirect, and you kind of have to work with what you have in the sheet. So I'll promise you I'll we'll see a bit more data in a moment, yeah. So what we can do is we can do however measure the persistent size of the whole sheet. You get to this data varies. I can tell you about this in a moment. 
and you can always be calculated if you have the uh, feel like as well. And so you can get, well, you get a certain spread, but you get something with all the dots around all of about two hours, yes, of persistence time. This is overall cell type, if so far investigated with all the material. You can get a physical and then you can get a new velocity. And then you're almost there because we do one more thing is that these cells divide and die, yes, in the sheet. So we added a extremely simple model, but which is turns out to be as far as we can tell, actually be quite useful. So it's, it's simple. So every cell looks at how many neighbors do I have? They will have a division rate which depends on how many neighbors I have. So if I have less than six, I'm allowed to divide and the linear rate decrease my division rate from the base rate, rate, depending on how many I have. And uh, I, I should say in this model, you get squeezed out randomly or you die randomly. Of course, you could also have made that from density dependent. But the combination of having um, one of them density dependent allows us to reach a steady state in this model. So it, it, is, it can reach homeostasis in this, if that's uh, feedback. And I should say this is a very simplistic model to this report as a function of distance. And we have a fractal repulsive type of interaction. It's been a simple, not perfect model here. I should say, uh, if you have one or a you get trouble here, so you can't do this with a one or model, just for reference, yeah. And so you have this, a fraction of the, so their division rate ratio of that to be and ratio of the fraction of models, parameters only. So this is work, um, I had the reference here with uh, colleagues in Grenoble, yeah. No, in this case, uh, it's very simple model. If you have a lot of neighbors, you don't divide. And you die you know, randomly, we, we could have added that too, but so we only done the density dependent than one. We could have done that as well, and it would have given more or less the same result. Yeah. Do you know in, in the experiment, yeah, uh, in the cells we have could be slightly boiling or something? Uh, excellent question. I don't know, possibly. They're not particularly dense, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, that the lack of nothing. That it's it's genetics, love, and you don't quite have the tools to really know about the stuff, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So okay, this is a theory model. So you get a face diagram, and I don't want to spend some time on it, but mostly there is a region here. If you just set the division to this and this small, you can get a phase which I would call constant self-melting phase. Yeah. And the constant self-melting phase, uh Here's the reference. Yeah, it's, this is what it looks like. So, what you see here is this individual divisional density, right? So, you create the law of the velocity, as you can see, this sort of tissue to be spread into the tissue, but not the tissue. So, you get into the position of all of these things happening. The blue things are great, the particles. And in fact, much to the consternation of a couple of our colleagues, this thing is not as fast. So, this is a very dense system, dense tissue, but it's not a graph. In fact, you can see the use of the space and you can use it and after you drive in or you can use the wheel, it can always be a liquid, it can always eventually flow, essentially because things put each other out of the way, even though it's a people average constant. So you are this is a continuum equation, and this is a come back, you can do the difference between the region and that. And in fact, you do an average zero, but the frustration ground on zero, and that's enough to make it seem liquid instead of solid. But in any case, but what I'm telling you right now, you only use this as the final ingredient to find this model of the system. And if you do, this is what you eventually get. That's sort of reason the parameters based on the cell type. This is our best fit softness model. Ignore the holes. This is the attraction here. This is not the representation. Yeah. And we can do a softness subdivision. Obviously, we have the perfect problem in this case without the region because of A2, I told you about. So, Quantitative model, semi quantitative model, I should say, but it has microns, it has hours, it has thicknesses, it's susceptible. Yes. So the question is so, what do we do with this? And so I'll actually step back slightly and switch gear, and I will promise I will come back to this. Is well, you sort of hit the limits of what you can do with the simplest model of uncorrelated feedback. So I currently just an activity with just Going the same direction, I don't care what the rest of the universe is doing. I have a relaxed that assumption. And I will continue for the moment the crawling motility and add feedback to it. 
then you can get several things. And this is not as developed, but I'll come back to similar systems in a moment. So what, so the question is, what could I add? So let me uh, break a lance for what we call now self alignment or force alignment feedback. So this is again, is observational because it's extremely hard to, you can't just take a cell out, put it on a plate and measure what it does because it's not really the same thing as an FA2. So again, this is indirectly inferred from what fish do. So people have talked about something called fecal plastic, the migration along the principal stress direction. People have also observed oscillations if you put a cell in the confinement. So it's nice, regular oscillation. And people have also observed blocking the compact cap with quite a bit similar. So this is a picture with one here. Bravo et al. Well cited paper from about 15 years ago. And what they said is, well, let me put something very simple in. So I'm not explicitly going to say that my cell that is made with like a cell of birds. Instead, what it might do, it might react mechanically to the force exerted on it. So if my cell is being pushed by its neighbor, but it might also, it might align with direction of migration and And while this is not a pretty way of writing it, that's exactly what I found out here. The alignment with the with the velocity with the with the total force on the system and over the dynamics. If you do this, something very interesting happens. If you do this and put it into confinement, you see something like that. You see nice regular oscillations in the system. Qualitatively, again, similar to, to what's, what's been seen. And if you put it outside of confinement, it makes a flock, as the original paper already mentioned. Now, uh, we more recently here with uh, the Winter Nobler, they applied this to a one dimensional cell sheet, a two one dimensional cell sheet, so just cells in a single channel, which make oscillations back and forth. And it needs this is a good model for that kind of oscillation. I should say that some other people here, but they might at all the similar type of model of on the cell sheet. So I should say briefly that you can actually the theory of this. In fact, uh, we did theory of this a long time ago without knowing that it could pop up anywhere. And you can show that this is oscillation along the lowest energy normal mode of the system systematically. So you get that is an oscillation set by the mechanics of the system so we can get an active solid type of problem. I should say, if you see an old video short talk more recently about the sort of collective vaccination, there's the same sort of coupling mechanism which describes oscillators as well. So far we can tell this is all the same sort of active solid feedback type of mechanism. So that's very cute. And unfortunately, I wish I'd, uh, I could tell you more about this currently, not so far. And but I would like to get back to actually modeling tissues. So what we did is as right after doing the uncorrelated driving, we actually saw uh, Jacob Notbom uh, started talking to us and said, I have some really nice data on actually the actual crawling um, forces on such, such cells and their velocity and everything. And so we modeled this for him. And in fact, I would have loved the velocity alignment and the Wittrich style pair alignment. Either one would have worked though. And we managed to point to the game model with anticipated green sheets with it. And I should say, and I don't have parameters here, that the parameters we need in here are within 50% of the ones from, from the end from the formula material. So this is not just parameters pulled out of the, of the, of the ether. It seems to be reproducible. And I'll have one more to show you after. And the important bit here is this was born on the text. It, which comes back again that we have sort of sub blocking levels of alignment. So here, much like when people talk about active thematics, we're in a disordered phase of the system, and we just have a bit of correlation between the active driving of things, which is interesting. See here with the subtractions here, so you can barely see it, but these are actually slightly correlated with each other. And that's sufficient to point that we really match things. And I should say we have some hints that even in the corner it looks like that. And in fact, I would like to get back to the corner. Uh, and I haven't told you about the cornea, so I should have told you the reason we actually look at the simultaneous epithelial cells is because this is what Marcus Lab is actually all about, looking at how the cornea, in this case of a mouse, works, but the same thing about for humans. So the idea here is that the cornea is something like, um, what? 
this is an eye. Here's the ocular here. And here's the pupils. Then there is a region here for the lymphus, which produces stem cells. And these things that will start migrating to the cornea. And that whole thing makes the steady state pattern of research between the cornea. We need to do this because the cornea is transparent and there's not vessel, doesn't have another mechanism for really maintaining itself easily. And so this thing is called an excellent observation motor. It's the same thing you see cat like that. You always know it's a female cat because uh, the color gene of cats is on the X here. And so the cat, which is both red and black, has X turned off in, in one. It, 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 it one part, one part of itself and not in the other. And here's the same thing with blue and white for cells of the colonia, otherwise the cells are the same. Essentially what you see here is lineage tracing for the, the pattern of which cells came from which cells, in this case, from the tumor stem cell migrating up in there. You see the pattern of how the cells flow and in the center and put the food, you know, you end up with a perfect, nice spiral here on top of the thing. Um, how are doing with time share? Actually, not so bad, yeah. And so I want to, yeah, it's long story short. Uh, what is this thing? So well, in the on physics, we all know the law of the quaker way of theory. So, and you can indeed put up the particles onto a photosphere. That's why it's coming up as well. You can put and things, but you get with a nice, rotating clock and some other related space with the pathological defect of one here and with another pathological defect of one here. But the idea here is that what we actually see in the eye is like one half of this, but it's one half of a sphere with different body conditions, a plus one in here, and then from the conditions activity and everything else conspired in such a way to make it to make it a steady state spiral clock. So the idea is really simple. And in fact, you might ask, well, pneumatics, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you can actually look at elongated nerves of the cornea, which is underlying this thing. And in fact, these are long and thin, so they should not be pneumatic, but turns out they're not. They make plus one or okay, maybe minus one to do what you can underlying the thing. So we're pretty certain whatever the fluid of yourself may rating over this, which is, which is polar, but not pneumatic. So if you put all of that together, you can make a neat model where you say, well, here's my cornea, 70 degree angle. Uh, there's stem cells here, there's some barrier here, and then everybody else is born, is born here and migrates up and makes a vertical defect. And you can see a detail here, it's actually quite neat uh, use of um, like branch multipliers and projections. Now, the idea is simple getting this to the front, this is the part. And actually quite hard. And so we again went back to the lab in vitro and looked at colony of expert excellence and size of the cell, which might be right off these experts onto a different substrate. So that's the different types of plastic, which makes them look different because they've been spread out by the fried egg again. So we get this, we, we try to fit both of these with the model that we have already. And so we can fit both of these, but with different values. And I mean, we use the same values with exceptions for the cellar radius and the velocity of them. So they're smaller and, 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 and so smaller and taller and slower if they're in the exoconia and when they're on the sheet, on the, on the plastic substrate, which is much safer. So, so eventually you can fit these again with pretty much the same parameters as the data two examples I showed you before. And then you'll eventually get this. Can we play this? So, blue and white cells random, then we have stem cells at the edge, which give rise to blue white cells. I should say, not many cells are actually born there. Sorry for this memory issue. Not many cells are born there. Most of them are descendants of other cells which are born there. So, it's TA cells, they get replaced a couple of times before they hit the center. But what you can see is that you autonomously create a steady state spiral in this thing. And you get this, uh, I should say in, in the bio literature for this, people have all kinds of uh, interesting hypotheses for why this happens, including electrical fields, rails on the cornea, all kinds of ideas. So here it happens just spontaneously because of a little bit of alignment between, partic between particles. 
So you can quantify this thing uh, using topological defects. So it is a spatial temporally coarse grain, and in fact, you can see that you can speed up a little that you can get between the coarse and over time, and you get in between velocity and the direct both the spiral field emerging in here. So you can compare this to uh, experiment. This is painful because this is extremely hard to do. The eye is, the eye is large, you can't put it under confocal easily. If an eye it focuses the light, it also takes two weeks to resurface. You would need to form hours well anyway. So, end result is it, it's on post mortem detected eyes. And then you, you draw lines on these along the stripe, and then you shrink wrap it back on the surface and do the next wire model to find the missing arrows in between. And you will eventually. Get these sort of inferred velocity direction field with the topological defect and very systematic, repeatable uh, pattern of a tightening spiral angle in the system. So, ask, please ask me more of this. Is this is almost done as well? Anyway, yeah. So we're writing this, and uh, but I want because I wanted to spend a lot bits of time I have on something different. Yeah. And it was not the same. Uh, no, it's not. It's random. And as far as we can tell in the experiment, it also becomes slight bias, but that's because eyes aren't completely symmetric. It's an actual left eye and right eye. But there is nothing, this is not chiral. This breaks the field symmetry spontaneously. If there's anything chiral, it might be in, in eye shapes, not in, not in the cell. Do you know how many sites have stem cells? Yes, so, I mean, the blue and white get incidental, which is just it's, it's random, but. We have to, in fact, we have to tune the, um, the, 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 the growth rate of how many, how many stem cells give rise to this for it to match. Yeah. So we have made a rough estimate that's consistent with something sensible. But I would lie if you said we had an extremely good handle on it. Yeah. Yeah. And this, the absolute value, so you said the sign of the parallel can change the absolute value always. They're an average or is it sort of spread around? No, but you could see, okay, yeah, so I mean, I flip these and uh, also the other interactions of visualization. This is, this is the this is the uh, experimental range. So they all go almost like this, yeah. So they all repeat, repeat, repeat pretty much the same shape, yeah. And so I should say, okay, here's a very bit of simulation. So one important bit is qualitative important that we need alignment for this to make a spiral. If you don't, you don't get as far as something like this, and more importantly, it never resurfaces the center because it gets stuck at the edges with a dead end division, and you get like a crowd going in and then getting stuck and never getting through to the center. But qualitatively, color resurfacing needs to have it needs only happen if you have a line of presence and you keep that presence, otherwise, it doesn't. And then finally, uh, the shape of this spiral actually depends on the radius of the things, but there's some very interesting interactions between curvature alignment and then stuff which we don't quite understand yet. Yeah. And it becomes this sort of tight and spiraling only at the center of the radius, which is which is uh, the life side. You will see it one and one and only simulation with stuff this. Um, I would really like to talk a little bit about the last piece of it. So I will go on for now. And there's something completely different, which is interesting, and which Russ could touch upon already last time, is that this is neat, but everything I've told you so far is falling on the top grade. However, in development, typically in what's happened, things are pulling on each other primarily. So what happens is that productivity into this, it just stop pulling on each other. And in particular, yeah, this is in collaboration with all of these people. So in particular, Rasko Tani and Deems, who is going to be here next week, uh, as case wire, so our experimental collaborator from Dundee, look at big angles, and you've seen this movie from Rasko uh, last week already. And as you remember, you get these double spiral flows emerging before the primitive streak. So what happens with this here to this region, where the embryo will fall inside out, it will be the structure. This is achieved with that little substrate as fluid on both sides, but there isn't a substrate. So, whatever is happening here actively, it things pulling on each other are possibly dividing and squeezing out and so on, but it's definitely whatever it is, it's not falling. And in fact, it does some rather interesting things. So, as I said, it's 
So he's putting on this sort of a symmetry. So dipoles, not vector, thematic symmetry, not full of symmetry. And it makes the engine of all of this happen is the reason called the signal, which makes the streak. So it's slightly equivalent to so it's like this. It contracts and it expands in the opposite direction for the convergence expansion flow. And uh, if, if you look at this thing, it rather this all that it's liquid, it's rearranging, it's not sort of a nice kind of solid like to try to work out right into the equation. So it's a complex rheology. So famous last words, we tried to understand this thing, yes, after we got funding for it, yeah. And so you can quantify this in the embryo. And here's a patch of this particular tissue that might have been highlighted in green, yeah. And it does something rather interesting. This thing is polarized left right, made itself uh, would elongate it that way, and you can see the minus and being looked like long junctions, left right and still. Now, a normal material, if I pull on this thing left right, it will happen. It is low left right, right? Or at least the form. But this thing, it goes up down. And you can do this, you can quantify this using two little by partial learning. It's a lot of time compared to the integrated strain rate. Here x x bigger than y y and right here y y bigger than x x. That's really happening. And you can hunt this down to p one transitions, so rearrangements between cells. Uh, so I think maybe that's a picture, but if you want it, so if you want this, this is very I had Now if these rearranged, you look like this, in search. That's the P1 transition. So flip to the new DNA point and then the bones, yeah. And so you can make a distribution, and these also you have to believe me in this one are backwards from what you'd expect in a normal material. So this sort of thing's been seen. And I hope nature will forgive me for copyright here in uh in the top of the German extension, so same thing polarized up down, lower left, right. Okay. And so the hypothesis here is that in this system, somehow we can mechanically, possibly with uh, genetics, but I'll tell you about it in a second. You polarize it this way, and then you get access to one transition where you get your optimized component, where you accept that as strongly as the input, that it actually pulls back more strongly and then rearranges. Is that yeah. the component is polarized because we need both that time, so it's more like the genetic. Yeah, but symmetry is in the market, and the polarized, I mean, here yeah, generic, and first of all, it is solid. They call it polarized, anything under the topic. So, so uh, yeah, yeah. And then, so normally, if you like, yeah, yeah. of pneumatic symmetry in this yeah. 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 So, in slides, I wanted to see, yeah, exactly. So, in particular, so. Then, okay, you start opening reading biology, biology uh, uh, papers and talk to biologists, and you start, uh, uh, head starts hurting a lot. And then, if a part of summary of what people talk about is the following. So, traditionally, especially for the doctor, well, when he has, in, in fact, more in chemical patterns, you can break the symmetry by hand, so left, right, to up, down. Different, different be expressed and the mechanics is different and the soil is different and that's what the models do. Now, more recently, I should say there are already for the, for the chick embryo, we don't have any evidence that that sort of thing is happening and it's really all that would be extremely hard to maintain over a scale of several millimeters with, with the flow emerging. But people have also started talking about polarizing emerging from the chemical chemical feedback. So here is a partial list of the people who started looking at this. And so what we use is we use something which is more similar to concepts of what they do. So we try something here on this is this type simple thing. We only have the kind of chemical feedback. We don't have extra chemical traveling in there. So the only thing we have is something like catch point mechanism, where the reaction where the, where the junction reacts to the mechanics of everybody else around it and then builds up optimizing reacts to what's going on. And so this is, if you are being fancy, it's something like this could be the biological engine, yeah, in, in the system. And so here it is, yeah, so this is a simple one. So I want to go through the details. The idea is it's a bit prolastic uh, junction, and there is actomycin on there, and the myosin is very simple, has some mechanism, so it's an on-range from 
with cells around it, it has an operate, but the operate is essentially dependent and goes down the tension. Now, the a functional form, we chose for mathematical convenience, is a little bit of sigmoid function, yeah. But the general idea is to start that as transmutable and additive. That means, and then at the same time, that tension here in the junction depends, it is it means this for like the spring. So the tension itself here is over the dynamics of the junction again, it has a spring in it, which is this elastic, and it has a feed, which depends on the myosin on it. So the more myosin, the more tension, the more tension, the more myosin, the more tension, the more myosin, so the put of the feedback loop happening in this system. And uh, so there's three five cells in there. So the elastic ones are just relaxation of the microscopic junction. There is a myosin time scale of the feedback loop, and there's a, there, there is a viscous relaxation time scale as well. So we think when uh, biologically it's very hard to pin down that we think that these two have to be much bigger than the elastic time scale. So that this take minutes, elastic microscale is more like seconds, but extremely hard to pin down realistically. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter, but I'll tell you in a moment. So, okay, first of all, you can robustly this thing, in fact, can generate an engine. You can, make, you can make a tension to the contraction. If the external pulling is high enough, and the activity coupling target is high enough, the bottom is flat line, this thing can, in fact, generate contract, contraction and pull itself down to a point. Along this blue line, as you can see here carefully. So I'm skipping a couple of details, but it's essentially that. So if my tension is large enough, it can do it, okay, systematically in the original phase space. Now, that we got that far, I think, after six months, right? The hard bit was this. So, and that's, and I don't have all of the answers, but more questions than answers. The hard bit is, how do I couple this to a relatively simple model? And in particular, a vertex model, because as you all can probably appreciate, a part of this model can do this junction by any time. So on. I should say, by the way, the FTD cannot possibly do this because in junction, there are problems with the vertex model. Like junctions are not where we find things properly in the vertex model. We ended up with something actually really simple, which is something like one of the active elements on every single junction of my system, yeah, separately, and then couple this to a standard vertex model. The equations of motion are then built over them dynamic, minus grade the vertex model, plus plus active forces, and the active forces are all of these active terms from every single junction, so every single side of every single junction coming coming here, they all couple to each other, and we got that the vertices, so they're in, they're in parallel, yeah. It's like in parallel something this thing on top of every single vertex. So this is not actually junction. So this was not our first choice of model. And in fact, we went through about a hundred model variants. I'm not joking, in fact. Yeah. And there's all kinds of problems here, which I'm actually currently going back and investigating from the perspective. Just a couple of highlights. So vertex models have these all of the mechanics are state of self stress. Of local talks and all of these new things. A standard vertex model should say also if you put on it, the tension on these junctions is the same as in these junctions, it is a problem. Yeah. So we lost the whole year on that. There's network physics, there's fluidity transition, there's other reactive feedback, and then also that has some great fun handling to one transition, which I can tell you all about of it, which is in this case handled using um, algorithm we got in there in the dense case group. Which looks at um, the balance of forces before and after, and then you might infinite this and then get injunctions. So if you put all of this, and uh, yeah, anyway, uh, eventually you get this, yeah. So here's this very orbit system I'm pulling left right currently, as you can see. Let me hold it for a second because it's so I'm pulling this without activity left right currently. It has the junctions in there, but the feedback loop is currently not closed. So we have minus sin, polarized left right, and also tension polarized left right because of the junction elements only. Never yeah, five minutes, yeah. We'll get there. Never turn this thing on. In this region, it's only active. So in the in, in the central region, it will now contract again, see side forward, and negative one transition. There you go. That was the one transition to make an infinite internal strain inside the tissue. 
and you can quantify this systematically. And so there is in this model at least optimal region where two one transitions happen, and the optimal pulling force, optimal activity, which depends on power meter. You can compute this frame in the system using tools introduced by Paul Sardaner right here, so this is self dialing to integrate the uh, total strain rate for the ones to know this stuff, yeah. And you indeed get negative uh, pure, pure, pure strain, so positive if you are on like this, negative if you are on this. You can see the medium for the negative that's in the region. You can compute the time scale. And you can also, and that's important for actual biology, check that this is robust. So since you don't know what the time scales are, we just tried all of them, yeah. We tried different myosin and this is the elastic time scale, and it's almost everywhere except in some regions that might be extremely slow. You want to happen. And they happen, in fact, with the exact same amount of strain, no matter what we do, it's a discrete rearrangement after all. With some scaling, which we haven't really fully explored here uh, of the time scale of the one transition. Now, you might ask, well, the proof is in actually doing this to a tissue. So here you have a tissue. And what you can see from reading, so I'm putting the right the side here. And what you can see it's contracting now and elongating a little bit up down. And it's having the most amazing tension chains across the system, much like what you would call force chains in other materials. Now, it looks good and it rearranges a bit, but as you notice, it also stops doing it. So that's an open question. I believe it has a lot to do with complications of vertex models. We have no consensus yet, and I should say, Nobody else has a model which does this satisfactorily either. So, uh, but uh, you can, in fact, with, with the chains are really interesting. They come very readily out of these feedback loops again and again. And so, for us, I've always thought that this thing is a tough one. In fact, much like the ones you had in yours, probably for the same reason, yeah. But you can quantify this. And in fact, it does do one transition backwards like experiment up. It does convergence extension flow. Backwards, like the experiment does, and it polarizes in the opposite direction, like the experiment does. It's a bit qualitative, but we think we've captured something important from the mechanism here. And then, if I have one more minute or two, and I'm slightly stealing, I mean, Deems is going to talk about it at the workshop next week. So, you can also do a continuum model of this, which is for the funding here, and it's also in Deems. So, you can use the same feedback mechanism. Now, it looks in, in but if I use to do a full continuum model to the my sensor here, yeah. Um, this looks scary, but a little bit exponential in here, but it's in fact the same thing, except that it is separately along the two eigendirections of the system. And then if you transform it back, you get this, you get this particular type of tensile equation. So, minus and feedback is the minus and sensor. Total stress, which again has things in parallel. So, you have the passive stress plus an active stress, depending on the minus and sensor. And then the passive speed. It's a bit too elastic compressed to the Maxwell model. So, this is just Maxwell model with pressure and shear. Um, this property is being different, but you think the time scale. And you couple this to substrate via friction. So, no pollen in the substrate, but it's surrounding fluid where I can dump, I can dump momentum in. But if you do this, now this actually should have done that first. Uh, this very readily actually does some really nice convergence extension flow. So here I'm applying boundary conditions of pulling left right and pushing up down. I should say here at this point, these are weird boundary conditions. The material can get flow through the boundary, but the stress is only fixed on the boundary. So the material can go through, it doesn't conserve um, um, in fact density. And I think can divide, etc. So what you get is this whole pattern, so other way around from the direction pulling and this. If you guess you can see my xx and my y components being opposite to each other, which is driving all of that stuff, and get positive stress and velocity, which derives from this. And in fact, we can explain this stuff. So, okay, you can quantify this systematically if you get a nice pattern in here. You can use a rheology. So, this is split from a usual rheology plot to strain array with inside stress. The same thing as you pretty much have in the um, chicken with the picture. And you see the same characteristic stuff for a negative. Now, because and I can go into this if you're interested, this stuff is similar here without the yield stress, we can apply the heat that looks slightly differently in stress phase. And in fact, here we can this, this work by the mechanics. We need only a tiny bit of external applied stress. Yeah, almost done. 
and the same with software network, networks. And in fact, you understand where this comes from, and it's pitch work and bifurcation uh, of the mice and feedback dynamic about the critical activities. You have two branches up and down, the the conditions and decide of which piece of you have know, the diagonal pieces of the preference to exact and why why captures which, and this is what triggers all of these flows. And so with this, yeah, I would like to finish. Uh, open questions, more than, more than answered questions. So I think we only scratch the surface here. So how does development control these engines? Obvious chemical regulation, chemical testing, coupled mechanical control, but you don't really know. But is there a link to active thematics and all of these other beauty models? It should be by symmetry, but the details are complicated. And actually, if you, a, a special fun, my personal theory is that if you couple something like that, this to actual migration, you will get things which are both pneumatic and polar and resemble uh, those Celsius people talk about. And yeah, in conclusion, you can do cool things with social models. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I had a question about the reverse energy cascade that you mentioned. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's very brief. Yeah. Uh, and uh, is there a kind of quantitative uh, agreement with what, say, Olivia Bushko, so, or is it more kind of. I wish quality? I haven't had enough time to actually do anything systematic, but this is a more paper. Um, as far as we work, we're not really paying for this. So we're pretty convinced the same mechanism. My linear response calculation is around a different point. The then linear response calculation is really hard to prepare currently. And um, I need to go back and actually make a quantitative comparison. But in this one, I should say, that's much more obviously in lower smooths than in his. And I have, I have a couple of years why this might be the case, yeah. So resounding maybe, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you keep, yeah. When you have two cells like that, yeah. and then uh, you have something that can be different from one side and the other side. Yeah, okay, good question. Um, good question. So let me put them. Um, you can, but okay, you can sort of see it here. Um, there, there is, so we, our junctions have two sides, yeah. They have the same tension, no? so it's like one mechanical object, but there are two different lines of concentration on both sides. So, I mean, this is obviously the cartoon because we can't, right? But if I, if, if I have a cartoon or something like this, so obviously, my thing is not a monumental thing, it's something like this one here, one there. Yeah? So, what it is driving, which is my computer side, is it, that. Customizing sensor, so that in the model you get that one concentration here, one concentration here, and the whole thing are coupled in parallel at one junction, passive junction, which has pieces from both cells, one, one this and one this, they're all coupled together. So since we're over time, we can probably stop in here, so okay, it's still for April next two weeks. Yep. So that's fine. All right. So they have a they have two talks from Thursday and on Friday. Yes, exactly. Yes. So sorry and for having a couple of all it's, it's yeah, so should, oh yeah, they're going to be in the middle room because they're apparently reno, uh, renovating this one here again. Yeah. Since last time we still didn't quite get there. Yeah. 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 Y